Okay, welcome back to our second lecture, BC 212 on Christian apologetics. We are talking about the resurrection of Jesus and we are trying to say how we can be convinced about the resurrection of Jesus just based on the evidence or the information that's given to us that um, you know we can be convinced and if you look at it very critically like um, a court uh, let's you know imagine ourselves being lawyers and looking at what happened you know can we convince ourselves and others who question the the validity of the resurrection of Jesus so we mentioned four we went through four quickly we went mentioned the broken Roman seal the fact of the empty tomb the large stone that was moved the Roman guards who ran away and then they were paid money to circ circulate a, you know a, a wrong story to explain uh, the missing body of Jesus. So number five, look at it. Fifthly, grave clothes were left behind. So we have to imagine, even if the 12 disciples of Jesus came to steal the body, okay, so according to their tradition, the body is wrapped with a lot of cloth, and embalm, they put some, uh, you know, like, a, like something like an ointment that would over time become hard. Right? It'll become, it'll make the, um, the, the, the cloth, um, make it firm, make it hard, like a case, like a shell. So they did that and they put the body of Jesus in the tomb. So this is three days later, so that uh, the, the grave cloth, must have become somewhat harder. Right? Like, I mean, not saying it would have fully become hard, but it is slowly, it becomes slowly, you know, the cloth and becomes slowly thick. So, the disciples have come to steal the body. Imagine, somehow the guards were asked to sleep. Twelve disciples came to steal the body. They moved the stone. Do you think they will stand there and say, take the cloth out now? <laughs> Let us only, we want only the body. <laughs> take the cloth out. And you can imagine them, you know, holding the body and they're trying to take out the cloth, <laughs> remove the cloth. That too from, you know, the cloth must have been from head to toe and must have become a little sticky by now. They'd have put that, you know, whatever that embalming thing is. It must have become a little bit sticky. So it's not easy to take it out. It must have been. And so you can imagine they come to steal the body and you think they'll be doing this, <laughs> taking the cloth and then they fold it nicely and keep it there. <laughs> Maybe somebody needs to use this. <laughs> they fold the cloth and keep it nicely and then say, we only got the body, let us go. I don't think anybody will do that. Even if they have come there, they've managed to open the tomb Within two minutes, take the body, run. Cloth and everything, run. We will take out everything later. But what we are seeing is something very different. We are seeing his cloth, the grave cloth, which wrapped his body, it is lying there. It is left there in the tomb. And the cloth that was to wrapped around his face was folded and kept. That means uh, whoever is, uh, you know, they're not worried about anything. Fold and keep it. Which we have to think: Would somebody coming to steal the body have done this? If they've come to steal, they would have taken everything and gone. Why the they've left the grave cloth behind? Why have they folded the face cloth and kept it nicely there and then gone? Why? Okay. So this is again one more thing to think about. Hey, was the body stolen? 
or did he actually rise from the dead and that when he rose uh, you know he the supernatural work of god just took off the cloth just left it there Number six, so now Jesus' appearance is confirmed. So the Bible tells us for 40 days he showed himself alive. Immediately after his resurrection, 40 days, he showed himself alive. And uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 that there were 500 people, at least 500 witnesses. Now, in any court, if you have three or four witnesses saying the same thing, that is good enough. Here you're having 500 witnesses. 500 people are saying, we saw Jesus. Yeah. In those 40 days, we saw him. 500 people. So, this is important. Secondly, among the witnesses, you also have somebody who was a hostile witness. So now if you go maybe 10 years, we're going 10 years after the resurrection. You come to about 80, 40, and you think about a man called Saul of Tarsus. He is uh, against Jesus. He is actually persecuting the Christians. And he is saying, I saw Jesus. I was on the way to Damascus. It was 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Bright light. So I'm not imagining something. Everything was fine. Suddenly there was a light that was even brighter that came and I heard the voice of Jesus. So we are saying 10 years later, somebody is having this kind of an experience and saying, I saw Jesus. And he is a hostile witness. That means he is not uh, one of the disciples or anything. He was actually an opponent of Jesus. And he's saying, I saw this bright light. I heard the voice of Jesus. And I'm following Jesus now. Right? So that is 10 years later. So Jesus is still alive 10 years later. And it is a light from heaven. And what is most amazing is his own family became believers. So why is that important? Because... Jesus had some half-brothers, meaning other brothers whom were natural born to Joseph and Mary. They all grew up in the same house. But these brothers, they did not believe in Jesus during his earthly ministry. Hey, he's our brother. He must be doing some trick, getting all these people to follow him. So in John chapter 7, we see this, right? Um, his brothers said to him, that means Jesus' own brothers, right? You know, they said to him, you, know, you, you and your disciples, you go. Or it says there in John 7, even his brothers did not believe in him. John 7, 5. So that means during his ministry, while he was preaching and teaching, his own brothers didn't believe. No, no, no. He's doing something wrong. Something. He's cheating all these people. We know he's our own brother. He was there. We grew up together. But in Acts chapter 1, the mother of Jesus and the brothers are all sitting in the upper room. Waiting for the Holy Spirit. So say, hey, what happened? While he was alive, you didn't believe. You saw him killed on the cross. Now you're quietly sitting in the upper room, waiting for the Holy Spirit. 
what happened only one thing could have happened his resurrection because they all saw him die they saw how he was crucified on the cross they must have been thinking, ah see our brother he cheated all these people this is what he got till that point they must have been thinking like that then something changed they're sitting quietly in the upper room the same brothers and one of those brothers his name is james he becomes the leader of the church in jerusalem and he writes epistle of james so think okay something has changed these brothers didn't believe till he was crucified they didn't believe next within next 40 days they have become believers why only reason can be his resurrection because if he had not risen from the dead they would have said funeral over we will carry on with life but it didn't happen like that so what we're saying is see there were 500 witnesses his own brothers have become witnesses and 10 years later we have a man like Saul who also has changed so this is enough proof that Jesus rose from the dead enough last two points uh, number seven the disciples own lives that means you know See, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, you can think, these 12 people followed Jesus, 12 apostles. One of them, of course, betrayed him, so we have 11. Uh, they could have said, ah, maybe we all, we all got cheated, no? He died, he went off, we got cheated. Let us go back fishing. Go back to our own work. Continue with life. Three years wasted, it's okay. <laughs> we, will, we will carry on. <laughs> That's what would have happened if it was just the way things would have gone normally. Yeah, we got fooled for three years. Or at least we were here, we heard what he said. He said nice things. What finished. His life is over. We will kind. But 12. Of course, they replaced Judas. These 12, all of them gave their life, were martyred. All of them, right? They gave their life for what they believed. You know, this Jesus rose from the dead. They were preaching from the beginning. They waited for the day of Pentecost. And their message from the beginning was, He rose from the dead. And we will die for it. So these are the, we're not talking about just some, you know, strangers. We're talking about these people who were with Him. They, they had the choice. They could have quietly gone back. Which has happened, like, if you read the book of Acts, you know, in Acts 4, uh, and, and, and again, other places, they, they mention other people who had followers, but when they died, those followers were all dispersed. That means they, there were other people during, during you know, Bible times who came preaching something, something, and people followed them for some time, and when they died, everybody dispersed. But in the case of Jesus, it didn't happen that way. These 12 men stayed, and from the beginning, they preached His resurrection, and they gave their life for that message. And lastly, number 12, we can say, lives are transformed, miracles still happen in His name, that today, if Jesus was dead, there won't, lives won't be changed, miracles won't happen. But Jesus is alive, therefore, we can believe for lives to be transformed and miracles to happen. So eight facts that convince us that the Lord Jesus rose from the dead and he is alive today. Right? Any questions on that? Any questions? Yes, go ahead. 
Um, Pastor, so uh, like I don't know if you heard of this archaeologist, but um, like he he has uh, found like some things like from the past, like David's time or Jesus' time, and uh, about Jesus is uh, like where uh, I think he found the blood of Jesus. He found, he found the blood of Jesus. Yeah, I don't know, but it is like. Yeah. So, like, he found his blood, and then he uh, gave it to the scientists in Israel. In in Israel, and then uh, they uh, looked it up. They saw the blood, and it had only twenty three chromosomes. So then, so then uh, they were like, "What is this? How can it exist? And who has this? Because we need to have uh, forty six or something, mm -hmm. right?" So, uh, so that guy said, "It is your Messiah or your Lord." They found the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Yes. So they tested it. There's any still alive and no. Two pairs. Mm. Okay. So can we like, uh, take that? as like one of the evidences of Jesus being alive also? Okay, so first of all, I don't know about this. I haven't read about it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I remember this was mentioned some classes back. Um, so, but I, I personally, you know, I haven't looked into this, so I don't know. Uh, maybe I should go and look into it. Uh, so, I don't know. I can't speak to it. Uh, what we would need to do is check if it's a reliable source. Like, has this been verified? Uh, who's the one who's reporting it? Uh, has it been verified by some independent scientists? You know, so like, is it authentic? Is this news authentic? Because nowadays, uh, a lot of things can go online, and you know, so so that's the first thing. Uh, if it is authentic, okay, it's good. But um, I don't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get necessarily so excited just about that, you know. Like, okay, this, this, uh, there's so much more uh, to our Christian faith. So uh, it's good, good to know if it's authentic and if it's genuine. It's good to know. But uh, I, I wouldn't like highlight that so much, simply because lots of people can say lots of things, and they themselves can, you know, do lots of other. Um, bring a lot of other information, so then it becomes a battle of information. I got this, and you got that. You know, when you're fighting with, uh, so I think it's just best to stay with the truth. And um, for God TV, on God TV, is it? Okay. Let me go and check it. I don't know. Uh, Goliath's head also. <laughs> All right. I don't know too much about that. All right. Any other questions here? Prince has a question. Uh, a believer's continuously living a sinful, ungodly life will end up. Will he go to heaven or not? So, Prince, I would point us to at least one passage of Scripture in Galatians 5. Paul is writing to believers in Galatians 5, and he says, uh, he teaches us that very clearly that if we live according to the works of flesh, he says, you know, we will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So, um, so based on that, and I'm just looking at Galatians 5, where Paul clearly tells us, we cannot, or then you can also look at Romans 8. He says, um, you know, yeah, if, you, if you live after the flesh, we will die. Uh, but we have to walk according to the Spirit. So Romans 8, Galatians 5, uh, it clearly tells us that um, living continuously in sin is unacceptable. First John chapter 3, uh, John writes, whoever is born of God does not continue in sin. Right. So the Bible is teaching us that we, we should not. Uh, 
So the answer to the question is, we will, you know, if, if a person is living according to the flesh, she will die. The whole issue is, you know, when and how, you know, there's a person who begins, who has accepted Christ, uh, who may have had a genuine experience of salvation, uh, but then goes away into living in sin, living ungodly. When does that shift take place? That is something only God can see and God can decide. Right? So we just follow the instruction of Scripture, live righteous. But what if a believer goes away living ungodly? Well, uh, we know that um, that kind of a life will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but when does that change take place? That we will, you know, God can see and God will decide. Okay. Question. Question. We have been saved, and uh, and we are living a very holy life, fine. And because of our uh, body bodily things and all, uh, I did a sin. I, I I accepted Jesus. I'm living a holy life, and and I sin and I sin. So after instant of time only next, I've died. So uh, if we because we uh, the other thing is I didn't repent it for the sin what I did. Yes, and I died. So do we are we going to heaven or yeah that's why but but the co the thing is faith on Jesus that but there is a little doubt yeah on this so you can also think about it right think of Jesus is coming from heaven the trumpet is sounded that moment so many believers have just committed some sin but the trumpet sounded they don't have time to repent will they get caught up in the rapture or not <laughs> you know we can think about these scenarios right. So, whoops. Uh, so my answer to that is, yeah, we will be forgiven and taken into heaven because, uh, you know, our sins are forgiven based on our faith in Jesus Christ. And God knows at that moment, okay, that instant, two seconds before, you know, either the person died or Christ came, he got angry with his dog or he kicked his cat or that's, did something terrible. Uh, you know, uh, so we might, you know, again, we don't have a chapter and verse on it, but my, my thought is that hey, we are saved by grace, you know, God will take us. But so that's a different scenario. Whereas in the, in the description, what the question that Prince asked, this person is continuing to live ungodly, continuing in sin. So life's uh, continuing in sin, is ignore, willfully sinning without repenting and turning to God. That's a different scenario. Yeah. Awesome. So, Pastor, uh, I'm asking about the um, the disciples. I mean, I already told you earlier that um, the Pharisees, the priests, like they they believed what Jesus said that he would rise on the third day. That's why they did all of that preparation. But then uh, the disciples, I mean, they did not understand, did not get it. So, um, and the other thing is also like we see later on that Jesus actually. Um, not block their minds of understanding, but um, like later on, he finally opened up their minds to understand. I mean, like, I mean, why did God do that? I mean, um, yeah, it was true that during his ministry, when the Lord Jesus was speaking to his disciples about his death and resurrection, they didn't understand. They didn't really get a grasp of what he was talking. But after his resurrection, he opened their understanding. Look, look at 24. And I think it's more of a revelation coming to them. Right? That, oh, now all of those scriptures make sense. Right? Uh, maybe at that time, they were looking at Jesus, and their focus on Jesus was this man is going to be the Messiah, and they probably were looking at him as the one who's going to become king. Right? They were looking at that part of him. That, because, you see, even after his resurrection, Acts chapter 1, the question they're asking is, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? That means, are you going to give us back, you know, are you going to make us 
kings, you know, give us authority and overthrow these Romans. You know, so, so that's been their mindset. Hey, this Jesus is going to be the Messiah who's going to establish the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So that was their expectation. But Jesus was saying, I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to rise up. No, no, no. Nobody will not let anybody touch you. <laughs> Peter's responding. As his mind is, hey, you have to set up the kingdom. I will sit on your right hand. He will sit on your left hand. <laughs> so they are thinking that way. But Jesus is saying, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to be crucified. I'll rise up the third day. What is he talking about? They didn't understand those things. That was not highlighted. That was not, you know. But when that happened, and then they saw in the scriptures that the scriptures all actually spoke of the Messiah as a suffering servant. They were only looking at Messiah as the king. Right? So the book of Isaiah. Yeah, Messiah will come as a king. The government will be on his shoulder. He will establish his reign and the lion will lie down with the lamb. Uh, you know, that will be his reign. So they're looking for that kind of a time. But Isaiah also said, Messiah will come. He will die. Isaiah 53, he'll die on the cross. Uh, he will be crucified like this. That they didn't understand. So after Jesus explains them, explains it to them after his resurrection, then they receive the understanding. So that's the difference. Why would they think that? Because Jesus already explained to them that he did not come as they expected. He already explained to them so much. I mean, like, why do you think that they would still think that? I think it, it, it had to, to do a lot with their expectation. That means you can imagine you're going to the synagogue and you're hearing talk that Messiah will come and he will set up his kingdom here on earth, which is true. It is in the scriptures. For example, today, in our world today, there are what is called as ultra-Orthodox Jews. That means there are Jews, they are referred to as ultra-Orthodox. They, these Jews, do not recognize Israel as it is today. They are Jews, but they will not recognize Israel as a nation as it is today. Why? They are saying, no, 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 no. For us, the Messiah has to come. And he has to set up his throne. That is the real nation we are looking forward to. So that means they're still holding on to that tradition. So they are there still today. They call ultra orthodox Jews. They do not recognize what is like you know uh, Israel as a nation, the prime minister. All that uh, it's all man-made. We are not interested in this. We are waiting for the true Messiah to come and his kingdom to be set. So if you can imagine from those times beyond 2000 years, that was the expectation. So um, when they said we have found the Messiah, what are they expecting? Messiah, you're going to get rid of the Romans and you're going to bring the Jews back into power in our region. That is their expectation. So it took a lot of change in thinking to embrace what the scriptures already spoke about the Messiah, which they overlooked. That's the problem. Okay. So let's quickly now you know talk about. You know, and looking at Jesus, well, I just want to quickly do uh, there are two short chapters there. Um, so one is sal lesson number twelve: salvation in Jesus Christ. So, you know, when we present Jesus to the world, we are talking about the uniqueness of Christ. We're talking about you know when we are questioned about the resurrection, we can explain. See, this is why you, if, if we think through very clearly, we can say with confidence, Jesus rose up from the dead, even though we were not there. We can use the information we do have to be convinced. Then the next thing is about salvation in Jesus. Why do you say there's salvation only in Jesus? So that's why that's another question. Uh, that's another area where you know people will ask us 
why can't you just say there is salvation in every, every religion? You all follow what you want, we'll all meet in heaven. Why can't you speak that? Now, why do you insist salvation only in Jesus? So, well, we have to be very clear on that. Number one, because that is what the word of God says. Nowhere the Bible says, follow any path you want, you will make it to heaven. There is no nothing like that in the Bible. Bible is saying there is only one way. So if we are following the Bible, then that is the only thing we can say. Right? Secondly, because Jesus is unique, and we went through all of these nine statements in, in, the, in the previous lesson. So we are convinced that Jesus is unique. There is no one else like him. So we can say salvation is only in Jesus. Very unique. Nobody else comes near these, these things that we had spoken about. And number three, because Jesus provides a complete remedy for sin. And he brings us into a relationship with God. Right? So there may be, yes, we recognize there are a lot of good ideas, good philosophies, good maybe we could say, you know, uh, things that people can do, religions, this, that, a lot of good things are there. Yeah, we're not, we're not saying they're bad. But in dealing with the issue of sin and bringing us a relationship with God, only Jesus presents us with that. The, only the Bible is telling us. The Bible is telling us this, this is possible only through Jesus Christ. Others can say, okay, live nice. Live a good life, do a good, do a lot of good things, have a fulfilled life or whatever. But can you deal with sin? Can you bring us into a relationship with God? That's only promised through Jesus Christ. And um, we we receive salvation by grace through faith. It's a free gift. Right? It's not something we have to work at. We, it's not something I have to do so many good works. It's not something you know, that comes through a cycle of incarnation, reincarnation. Uh, it's not me depending on somebody else's good works. No. I can receive it. Each one of us can receive it by grace through faith. So th this is why we say there's salvation only in Jesus. So we must be very clear on that. Um, fine. Any questions? All right. So, um, let me see. I think we'll pause here. Uh, what we want to do in the next two lessons, 13 and 14 is, how do we, uh, let's introduce it and then we'll pause. How do we share Christ with a Hindu? How do we share Christ with a Muslim? Okay. So we're not going to go into one full study on Hinduism, one full study on Islam. That's not the point. What we want to do is we want to understand briefly a little bit on Hinduism. Understand what they think. Because there are similarities, but very different meaning. When we say... Uh, in example we mentioned already, when we say incarnation, that idea is also in Hinduism. But their meaning is very different. For us, we are saying this is God who came once, who became man. For them, it's like a lot of avatars keep coming. The idea is there. When you say triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, similar concept is there. The concept is there, but the meanings are very different. Right? So, when we are speaking and sharing the Christian faith, we must understand that we are saying something, they say they understand, but what they're understanding is actually something different. So we have to be very careful or very clear in what we are saying. So about Jesus, why Jesus is different, why believing in Jesus is different. So that is similarly in Islam, what is the difference? Uh, uh, Islam, people, uh, Muslims would have a lot of questions about Jesus because they consider him as a prophet. 
nothing more so then they will question why, why do you say he is god's son how can god have a son right how can he prove his resurrection you know so those are the that those are the things in the minds of muslims so the challenges with when sharing christ with the hindu the challenges with sharing christ with the muslim they're two different and we need to know how to present the gospel present the message of jesus in a very clear way for them each one are you talking about hindu or a muslim present it in a very clear way and then of course we let them make the decision right so we will do this next week uh, lesson number 13 lesson number 14 and uh, with that we will conclude this section on uh, looking at um, the person of jesus and then we'll move into some other topics uh, before we close all right any questions okay no questions uh, can somebody please close in prayer soul into your hand father guide us lead us through your holy spirit we submit the whole day into your hand in jesus name we pray amen all right thank you everyone for um, joining us today enjoy the rest of your day see you again next week bye now